right, so one more time, just would like to bring greetings to each one of you. Thank you so much for joining in for another new session, the third episode of, of Historical Journey of the Church. So basically, we are talking about how church started its journey and so far where we are. Where are our roots? What do we believe? What we believe is that something, the right thing that we are believing. Did the early Christians believe that? What Jesus Christ intended? What disciples learned? And what did they taught to the apostles? What the apostles taught to their fathers? What the church fathers took from apostolic teachings? All these things we will go through. But thank you so much for joining in. Let's jump in to our journey. And I do believe this has been a blessing for all of you. So the third episode of historical journey of the church. Again, this course is certified by Trinity Theological Seminary. Just would like to welcome each one of you for that. Now, so far we have learned about the teachings of Jesus Christ and the teachings of disciples. We just moved on to apostolic fathers last week. So when we are talking about apostolic fathers, the timeline is from 81 till 150, we saw the ministry of Peter, we saw the ministry of Paul, we saw the ministry of John. And the next one that we saw was in, you know, it was in AD 70, fall of Jerusalem happened. In AD 70, fall of Jerusalem happened by Titus. And this is one name that we need to learn now Clement of Rome. I know most of our Christians doesn't know this name if you have never been to history, but this may be a new name for you. But I want to tell you how they are connected. So when we talk about Clement of Rome, see Peter was ministering a little longer than Peter. Paul ministered and John the Apostle ministered almost close to 90, between 90 and 180, okay? So Clement was very familiar to all three of them. Clement was very, very familiar to Peter, Paul, and John. How do we know that? How do we know that? Okay. See, Paul talks about Clement. Paul talks about Clement in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. What does Paul say? Paul says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with you, dear, and I plead with Synthe, Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of gospel. Along with Clement, do you see that? Along with Clement, so when you see along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers, so this Clement that you're talking about is the same Clement that we are talking now. So when you see this Clement, Clement was a companion of Paul. Remember Paul is saying, you know, along with Clement and rest of my coworkers, that means Clement was a coworker of Paul. So, as I told you, Clement was well known to Peter, Paul, and John. He knew early Christianity. He was in direct touch to the disciples. Now, listen, we don't know. Clement might not have seen Jesus Christ because now we are talking history a little later, okay? So, Jesus went to heaven probably in 33 AD. So, Clement might have come a little later, might have heard the preachings of Paul or Peter or John, and he became Christian follower of Christ. He might not have seen Jesus Christ, but he was with someone who saw Jesus Christ. So think about this. You know, we all talk about those friends and pastors of this hundred years or 200 years. We talk about Azusa Street Revival in 1906, right? In 1906, Azusa Street Revival happened in Las Vegas in California. William J. Seymour, you know, this person, an African-American one-eyed person was the leader for Azusa Street 
revival. Now think about Azusa Street happened in 1906. If we are ready to believe a revivalist of Azusa Street, how much more we should believe to the people who were connected to disciples, who were connected to apostles. So think about if we believe William J. You know, Cyborg for Azusa Street, if we believe any other pastors of 100 and 200 years, because they are revivalists, because they are great teachers, if you believe in the writings of John Piper, if you believe in the writings of Rick Warren, if you believe in the writings of Rodolph Wood Woodman, you know, and all these things, if you, re if you read and if you believe in them, how much more we should believe those people or apostolic father who were directly connected to the disciples of Jesus Christ. That's why I said the first 200 years are very important for us, not the last 200 years. Remember, the last 200 years are not very important for us. The first 200 things are two years are important because after that fabrication happened. After that, many infiltration happened. After that, everything became uh, different. Church started going away from the real teaching. So first 100, 200 years are very important for us to learn. So we are putting a lot of time in first 100 to 200 years. And after that, we will rush, we will run fast. So I am not running fast right now. I want to give important time to that first 100 and 200 years. So think about this Clement. Paul is talking about this Clement. Now going forward, let's talk about Clement of Rome. He died, probably he died in 101 AD. Just, was, but when, if you see a picture like this, remember friends, many times, if you don't know history, you will see a picture like this and you feel like this is Clement. Let me tell you, these pictures are not real pictures, okay? These pictures are not real pictures. Clement, I don't believe that Clement ever wore a cassock like this. Clement will never wear a cassock. He will never wear a uniform because uniform was not a part of early Christianity. Bishops or church leaders never had uniforms. They were not they, they never had, a, because early teachings, early manuscripts, early documents doesn't talk about any kind of this kind of dress modes. It happened only after 200 years. So when you see a picture like this, don't get distracted that this is a real picture of Clement. Friends, somebody just made it. This is a painting. It is just a painting, okay? But this is you, when you open Wikipedia, you will see this picture. When you open Google, you will see this picture. It is not Clement, it is just a painting. So just bear with me in understanding that. Now, see about this Clement, it is mentioned by Paul in Philippians 4.3. We just learned about that. And what was the mentioning? Mentioning is that Clement was a co-worker of St. Paul. What, the next thing is, he served as an overseer at the church at Rome. He was the overseer. Or mean, when I say overseer, it's not like church of God overseer. No, it's not like that. Overseer means the head of the church that time or the leader of the church of Rome. So uh, Clement played an important role in the leadership of the church at Rome. So remember, when we are talking about, so Bible doesn't talk things about Clement. We, if we learn about Paul, if we know who Peter was, if we know who John was, if we know who Philip was, if we know uh, who James was, then it is also important to know who Clement was. See, all these disciples were the disciples of Jesus Christ, right? So the 66 books of Bible talks about the first 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Then it doesn't talk, the 66 books doesn't talk about rest of the disciples. Now, what I am trying to do is that we are also looking into rest of the disciples to understand the reality of the historicity of the church. Okay, that's why we are looking into this. So Clement served as an overseer. Tradition ascribes to him an epistle to Corinthians. Traditions believe that the first Clement or Clement wrote his first epistle to Corinthians. Like Paul wrote his 
epistle to Corinthians in the same way Clement also wrote epistles to Corinth. Now remember, there were so many writings during that time. Clement writing was very good writing, but it was not included in canon. It was not included in 66 books. You know why? One of the important rule when they framed the canon was this, either they should be directly connected to Jesus or disciples who have seen Jesus. We don't have any books who are not connected to Jesus directly or who have not seen Jesus. So one of the writing of this writing, there are several writings, hundreds and thousands of writings were there. Out of hundreds and thousands of writing, just 27 books were accepted in New Testament canon who were directly connected to Jesus or whose authors were proven as the disciples of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, these were not there. That's how we missed the first epistle of Clement. First epistle of Clement is not added in Bible because of one reason, he was not directly connected to Jesus Christ. Okay, hope you got it. So he wrote 1 Corinthians, address from the church of Rome to the church of Corinth. He was, when he was in the church of Rome, he wrote it and he wrote an epistle to church of Corinth. How, how would he know that? Paul used to do that, right? Paul living in Rome, writing to Corinth. Paul living in Ephesus, writing to Colossians. Paul living in Colossae, writing to Philippians. So it was all there. So Clement have seen this. So Clement, when he was in Rome, he wrote for Corinth. Now, he was from he was also known from other writings, but lost until 1627. There were other writings that Clement has written, but we lost those documents. We found few documents in 1627. There were many scrolls that were found and Clement's writing were also found, but that was not added to Bible in any way because there were so many questions about authorship. Patriarch of Constantinople gave manuscript to King James I of England. So Constantinople, the patriarch or the overseer of Constantinople, he gave this manuscript to King James I so that King James, when King James was written uh, in 1600s, he would add this letter to the Bible, but that was not added later on, okay? So this was published in 1633. See, one of the writings of his writing in Epistles of Corinthians, chapter 47, verse 6. What Clement is writing? Clement is writing. His writings are similar to the writings of Paul. This is how he writes. Shameful, beloved, extremely shameful, and unworthy of your training in Christ is the report that on account of one or two persons, the well-established and ancient church of Corinth is in revolt against the presbyters. So, as Paul is writing against Corinthians, if you write, if you, if you, if you read Corinthians, the epistle of Corinthians, first, first Corinthians and second Corinthians, Paul is actually very, he is disciplining them, right? He is writing, oh, Corinthians, who bewitched you? Who is doing this? Why would you do this? How these many sins are there? I have heard, I got report and all these right things that Paul was writing. In the same way, Clement also wrote from John, he is writing to Corinthians saying that, hey, how are you, these people, Corinthian church, you are ancient church, you are such a blessed church. I got the report that even having all this training, you are behaving so unworthy. You are behaving so unmannered. How would you revolt against your own pastors? Presbyters means pastors against your bishops, against your pastors. So it's writing to Corinthians who are revolting against their pastors, against their leaders. Again, he is writing in chapter 45, verse 1. You have studied the Holy Scriptures, which are true and are of Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unjust or fraudulent is written in them. See now, while he is writing this epistle to Corinthians, Clement is also talking, saying that 
I know how you studied holy scriptures. That means Clement is accepting the 39 books of Old Testament and the 27 books of New Testament. He's accepting that. He's saying that all those Old Testament scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, those are holy scriptures and which are true and are of Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unjust or fraudulent is written in them. That means Clement is telling them, hey, the whole Bible is full of Holy Spirit. It's full of truth. Friends, just think about when many people questions Bible, this disciple who was in first hundred years, this person is vouching for the Holy Scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. Going forward. Now, the next person is Justin Martyr. So if you have learned about Clement of Rome here, now Justin Martyr, right after Clement, see, these are the lifespans, Peter, Paul, John. Clement lived a longer than John. Probably he might have crossed 100. And then Justin Martyr comes in scene. Okay, Justin Martyr is between 100 and 170 AD. Okay, between 100 and 170. So definitely he, got, he was martyred, but somehow he got the name Martyr. He already had the name Martyr. So Justin Marty, again, don't go to the picture, okay? This is just a picture painting. It's not Justin Marty. But when you, whenever you open Wikipedia, Google, you will see this. So it is between 100 and 165 AD. He was born in Samaria. So Justin Marty was born in Samaria. Remember, he was not a Christian. He was not a Jew. He was a pagan and he had a pagan upbringing. He had a pagan upbringing. But he studied philosophy. He studied philosophy. One of the important philosophy that he learned was Stoicism. He was after Stoicism. So in his philosophical studies, he was searching God. He didn't see God in his pagan religion. That's why he went to study philosophy. While studying philosophy, different philosophies, he was searching God and truth, but he didn't find that truth in any philosophy. See, one of the important thing we all need to understand, this man who was born and raised in a pagan society, who studied philosophy during 100 and 165, if you know, Greek culture was very, very forward. They were very modern in their education. Greek had all kinds of philosophies. You, you know that Paul was confronting philosophers, right? When he went to Athens, he was confronting philosophers. He went to different cities where he was confronting philosophies. So in the same way, Justin Martin was trained in philosophy but he was pagan in his upbringing. But remember in philosophies, he didn't find God, he didn't find truth. And his questions were not quenched or he didn't receive answers of his questions. So what did it? One time, I will tell you a little story in here. One time he met an old man, an old man who used to go to church. This old man came and shared gospel to Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was pagan from his background. Second thing, Justin Martyr studied a lot of philosophy. He was doctor of philosophy. He was such a learned and educated man. But in his quest, in his thirst of finding God, he never found God. So what he did, he was searching through that this one old man, illiterate, uneducated old man came and shared the good news of gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to tell you, my friends, this learned philosopher, he wanted to see who Christ is. He went down, learned about Christ. And with his philosophical background, with the paganism that he had in his background, he started inquiring and asking questions about Christ. And he learned from all documents who Jesus Christ was. And in his philosophy, this 
Christ fits so well to define God and truth. That's how Justin Martyr became Christian. Can somebody praise God today? How God works. See, so remember a doctor, a philosopher, he could not find truth. He could not find answers of his question. Here comes a poor old guy, an old man on his way, on his way to journey, in his way in journey, just shared this good news. And after sharing this good news, this doctor philosopher was converted into Christianity because his philosophy, his empty philosophy, his, his truth finding things led him to Christ, the Logos. It was him, Justin Martyr, who bought the theme called Logos. Say the Logos, the real word. This is exactly the real philosophy. That's how Justin Martyr, you know, he, he found Jesus Christ fits perfectly with all harmony to be the only God and living God. Thus he became Christian. I praise God. Remember brothers and sisters, many times our philosophical mind can, cannot give us answers. We think scientific things can give us answers. We think you know, a lot of learnings will give us answers. Gnostics believe that knowledge can give salvation, but nothing can give you salvation. A simple gospel of Jesus Christ, just shared by an old man who was uneducated, Turn and transform this philosopher into a Christian who became one of our apostolic father. Friends, remember, never underestimate the power of gospel in your life. When you share gospel, when you share tracts, when you say a word, maybe some doctors and philosophers, they might underestimate you. But remember, God will never underestimate you. Your words can change some philosophers, some doctors, some learned galaxy into a dedicated and committed Christian who, who will be a great benefit in the kingdom of God. So never lose a chance of sharing the gospel to anybody. Can I get some good amen? People talking about this, those who believe, say amen. Everybody jump into the chat box and say amen to that. I do believe God has a special message when I teach you this history. This is how Justin Martin becomes Christian. Now, right now, he wrote two apologies. Apologies means apologetical letters, not that sorry. It's apological letters, okay? So apologies are in Christian fields, those are not known as apology, apology, but it is uh, apological letters. First, he dedicated to Emperor Antonius Pius and to the Senate of Rome. See, Antonius Pius was ready he had a lot of debates. So he, he was one of the Roman emperor who, 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 had, who had hard time to believe in Jesus Christ. So this pagan philosopher who became Christian wrote a dedicated letter to Emperor Antonius Pius and to the whole Senate of Rome describing Jesus Christ well-fitting in philosophy as the living God. Second, he wrote a dialogue with Trifo. Trifo is a Jewish writer. So if Emperor Antonius Pius was a pagan king, okay, a Greek king, but Trifo was a Jewish writer who was against Christian. So Justin Martyr, he wrote a direct dialogue of philosophy, fitting Jesus Christ as true and only God to this Tri Trifo, who was a Jewish writer. These were two important writings of Justin Martyr. So remember, two important writings of Justin Martyr. First, a dedicated writing to Emperor Antonius Pius. Second, a dialogue with Trifo. He was beheaded under Marcus Aurelius. So Marcus Aurelius, the son of Antonius Pius, you know, when he wrote this letter to Emperor Antonius Pius, his son was seeing all this. Marcus Aurelius was the son of the prince of, 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 of Rome. He was the son of Emperor Antonius. He was so furious. When he became king, he beheaded Justin Martyr. Just like his name, he became martyr for Jesus Christ. 
His name martyr was not given after he was martyred. No, even before he was, he was born, his name was Justin Martyr. And God was pleased to consider him as a martyrdom for Christ. Challenge, he challenge, you know, challenges authorities to investigate Christian. His important thing was he challenged authorities. He said, you investigate Christianity, study the word, see the documents, just don't deny Christianity. So he was there to challenge. When many isms came, many other philosophies came, he was challenging them. He answered charge of atheism against Christians, right? So when people said Christianity is about atheism, he, he answered their questions. He also answered the questions against those who look for a heavenly kingdom. There were questions, look, why do you look for a heavenly kingdom? He answered that question too. See, one of his writing, First Apologies 67, page 67. This is one of the writing. On the day which is dedicated to sun. Okay, now listen. He comes, as I told you, he came from a pagan background. When he says, on the day which is dedicated to sun, it is not sun, it is Sunday. So you might see, oh man, he is talking about sun. He's not talking about sun, he's talking about Sunday. On the day which is dedicated to the sun, that is Sunday, all those who live in the cities, who dwell in the countryside, gather in a common meeting and for as long as there is time, the memories of the apostles of writings of the prophets are read. Now remember, that means we know one more thing. During 100 and 200 ADs, common gathering used to be on Sunday. This is a proven thing. Through the writing of Justin Martyr, the common gathering was not on Friday. It was not on Saturday. It was on Sunday. It is a proven thing, okay? So this is how we prove one by one. When we gather on Sunday, people might ask, why do you do that? Hey, early Christians used to do that. See the writings of Justin Martyr. So whenever you come on Sunday, everybody who live in city, who dwells in countries are gathering common meeting. So someone who thinks that we don't need common meeting, Zoom platform is good for us. We don't have to go to church. We don't have to go to church. YouTube is good for us. Oh, I mean, I don't want to go. Who will drive that far? I mean, I don't want to go there. Now we are so comfortable in sitting in our houses, right? We want to just open our screens in our houses. We don't want to go to church. Friends, I want to tell you, if anybody in this platform, if you're missing your worship service, just because you're getting Zoom and online live things, remember, Early Christians, wherever they were, they used to gather together in common meetings, common meeting gathering. That's why Paul says, do not consider, do not ignore the fellowships, common fellowships. Do not ignore coming, coming together. Like many of them do that, friends. So what they do when they come in, they read the memoirs of the apostles or writings of the prophets. That means all the prophetical writings, Old Testament, apostolic writings, the New Testament, they read that, they talk about it. So Justin Martyr was talking about this. So friends, if you are coming on Sunday, from now onwards, you should not have a question. You should make sure, oh, thank God, early church, in hundreds and two hundreds, they used to gather on Sundays. I'm not talking about Middle East. You don't have a Sunday uh, off. So, you know, you come on Friday. That's perfectly fine. Don't worry about that. We are talking about Sunday being a holiday and you are not able to come together. Then, it, you know, just to consider that early church used to do that. So having concluded the press. Now, see, he's talking about how the church comes over there. They come together. And they, they read the books, they read the epistles, they read the Old Testament and what they do. Having concluded the prayer, we greet one another with a kiss. So kissing one another, brotherly kiss, that was it. And then what? And then there is bought to the president of brethren bread and the cup of watered wine. See, Justin Martyr is writing, we come together. 
We read the books, we preach, we pray together, we greet each other. And also what we do, we break the bread and we also drink wine. Which wine we drink? Not alcoholic wine. Hello. So there are people who think that, oh no, Christ said you can drink wine, you can drink any kind of wine. See the first apology written by Justin Martyr in page 65 explains what kind of wine was that? Watered wine, fresh wine, watered wine, not alcoholic wine, not fermented wine. So it was a common thing in first century church to have wine, which is watered wine, not the fermented wine, not the wine that is alcoholic wine. So you are getting answers of many questions, right? If you are getting that, if you feel like, oh, this is something very important, I need to know that, say amen. Put some amen over there, okay? If you really want to see something in there. Okay, so I am talking about the practices of first century church in 100 and 200 years. We are not going to practice what happened in 500. We are not going to practice what happened in 1080. We are not going to practice what happened in 2080. We are not going to practice what happened in Azusa Street. We are not going to practice in 100 and 200 years. No, we are going to practice the first 100 to 200 years. Can I get a good amen if you believe that? Our Christianity, our faith roots back to the apostolic teaching. See, again, the next words. He who valued above all else the acquisition of wealth and property. Now he's talking about how the wealth and how the prop property has to be, you know, has to be taken care of. We who valued above all else the acquisition of wealth and property now direct all that we have to a common fund, which is shared with every needy person. That means if somebody says, hey, why should we give to church? Justin Martyr is explaining that. It was the common practice in the church that we, if we have wealth and property, we give it to the common uh, common fund. There is a common fund in church. Giving was always there in church. There is a common fund. For what? To share it to every needy person. It has to be given to the needy person for anybody who are in need. So Justin Martyr provides that information too. All right. Now we are going to see Didache. The third important thing, Didache, I just want to run a little bit fast over here. Just join with me, okay? Didache, what is Didache? This person is not Didache, okay? So if you are thinking this person is Didache, no. Didache means the right things. You can write it down. Didache means the right things. Didache is not a person. Didache is a document. It is a writing. Didache, you know what? The after, you know, this is how you should remember Didache. After Bible, Didache was the most ancient writing about Christianity. After Bible, Didache. Didache was actually lost and found. We lost Didache in the beginning and then we found it later. So Didache in the early, during early persecution, every document of Didache was lost. Somebody hid it somewhere and we lost it. After a lot many years, we found this Didache. And when we opened, we found everything that is in Bible is in Didache. Years after we found it. Many times we, 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 we don't have answers. Why Lord, you know, allowed persecution? So when persecution was allowed, this Didache was hidden. Somebody just hid all these Didache somewhere. And when persecution was over, after long years, we received this Didache. And this gives us an authenticity. Everything that is written in Bible is so accurate and so perfect. So talking about Didache, also known as the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. Didache is also known as the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nation. Now remember, we lost this Didache and that's the reason which was not added to canon. And also in Didache, 
people were not very particular or people were not very sure about the authorship of Didache. We don't know who all were the authors. Exactly, we don't know. It is, the headings are the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles. So Didache was a common writing where many people wrote it all together and they claimed that what they wrote was the teaching of Jesus Christ. But just because the authorship was not very clear, these books were not added to the canon or not added to the 66 books of Bible. And also we lost it for long years. The first line of the treatise is, this is how the first line is written. The teaching of Lord to the Gentiles or nations by the 12 apostles, okay? It was written in Koine Greek. That means Greek, the Koine Greek is the ancient Greek language, Koine Greek around first and second century. So this didache, this writings were written in Koine Greek. This was not a translation. It was directly written in Koine Greek, all right? So earlier, all other writings were in Hebrew and Aramaic, which was translated into Vulgate or is into Septuagint. But this writing, Didache, was written in Koine Greek. The text parts which constitute the oldest extant written catechism has three main sections dealing with Christian ethics, rituals such as baptism, Eucharist and church organization. What were the important topics of these writings? Three important topics. Didache dealt with three important topics. Number one, what was the number one? Christian ethics. Second, talking about baptism. Third, Eucharist. Eucharist means Lord's table, okay? And also it, talk, it spoke about church organi organization. The Lord's Prayer is included in full. You can see Lord's Prayer in this Didache. Lord's Prayer is included in full. Baptism is by immersion. Earliest writing Didache says, baptism is by immersion or by effusion, I will tell you effusion, what does it mean? Or sprinkling, if immersion is not practical. Why people do sprinkling? Because they say Didache says that. What does Didache say? I will, I will read the, that, that document which talks about baptism. So, the common practice was baptism is by immersion or by effusion if immersion is not practical. So when immersion was not practical, why was that not practical? We will deal about it, okay? We will deal that. Don't, don't, don't go, don't, don't get disturbed. We will, we'll go through that. One by one, we will go through that. We need to learn these truths. The Didache is considered the part of the group of second generation Christian writers known as apostolic fathers. So Didache is considered as the part of the group of second generation. So who was the first generation? The first 12 disciples of Jesus was the first generation. Now, we spoke about Clement. We spoke about Justin Martyr. Well, we, we, are, we will talk about Ignatius. We will talk about Polycarp. These all are second generation. They wrote Didache, okay? And that's why Didache is not canonized because it was written by second generation. It was not written by first generation. Hope you got it. Tell me if you got it. Okay, good. All right, so this Didache was lost and discovered in 1873 by Philotheos Brynis, Archbishop of Constantinople. Many of the writings were found in you know, Constantinople. So these writings were discovered in 1873 that was lost in that 
between 100 and 200 years where there was severe persecution under Roman Empire, these didaches, these writings were lost. And, and these didaches were found back in 1873. And when they opened these writings, that was exactly the same replica of the teachings of Bible. So if somebody, you know, has kind of doubt like, oh, who knows Bible is truth or not? Who knows like, you know, Bible? Oh, I don't know, man. Somebody just wrote it. These are the documents that God preserved. I am thinking of, you know, if these didache would have been in the hands of Roman emperors, they would have burned it. Roman emperors burned a lot of documents. When the persecution broke out, they, they burned everything. I'm thankful to God that somebody just hid this didache for our generation so that today we can trust what is Bible. And I think this was one of God's way of preserving these truths. How many of you think that way? I think that way. As a, as a student of history, I think that way that God hid it and he gave us in right time. I believe that. I don't know if you believe it or not, but as a student of history, I do believe. As a student of Bible, I do believe this because Lord's way of working is very different. If we didn't have this, then, you know, authenticity has always been questioned. Now nobody can question. We have authentic, authentic answers for the first 66 books of Bible. So it had been known to Oregon and Athanasius. See, Oregon and Athanasius. We will be reading about Oregon and Athanasius very soon. They are also second generation uh, disciples, second generation writers, and second generation theologians, they mentioned about Didache. So if you read Oregon's writing, if you read Ignatius' writing, they have mentioned about Didache writes this, Didache also says this, even though Didache was lost after this, in the writings of Ignatius, in the writings of Oregon, they mentioned about this Didache. Significance initially ignored by scholars. Initially, scholars did not give a lot of importance to Didache because this was second generation writings. And many times they thought, that they, they thought the author is anonymous. Let me read something from Didache. Are you ready? Let's read something from Didache. So these are the things. So if you see the Didache, this is Koinonia Greek. If you can read Greek, this is Greek. I can read a little bit. Uh, we had some, uh, I had my advanced studies in Greek. I can read it. So this is Greek, Koine Greek. And uh, these are the translation into English. Okay, let's read it. There are two ways, one of life and one of death, but a great difference between two ways. The way of life then is this. First, you shall love God who made you. Second, love your neighbor as yourself and do not do to another what you would not want done to you. Is this something that you are familiar with? I am familiar with. I have seen verses like this in Bible. Love your God and love your neighbor, right? And it is exactly the same thing. See, Didache is writing. If you know Greek, Here's a picture, you can read it. And this is a trans translation. Then verse two, one says, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit pedastry. You shall not commit fornication. You shall not steal. You shall not practice magic. You shall not practice witchcraft. You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill that which is born. So Christians who are pro-abortion, who, who fight for the right of abortion, you are fighting against the principle of Christianity. The leadership, the churches, the presidents, governors who talk about 
abortion and they want to make abortion, legalize abortion. Let me tell you, it is against Christianity. It is against the teaching of Bible. Didache says, you shall not murder a child by abortion nor kill that which is born. It is shedding of innocent blood. We should not be doing that. So Christians, we cannot support this philosophy. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer who believe in Bible, you cannot support those parties, those philosophies, those practices, who are pro-abortion, who want to go with it, who want to legalize this. I know I am, when I talk about this, uh, I am in a country which, you know, uh, I may be banned to say this, but I want to tell you, this is the truth. Christians should understand our roots. This is our root. No matter how modern you become, no matter how postmodern you become, no matter how how contemporary you become, but our message cannot change. Our message cannot change. And as church, we should say amen. Our message cannot say, cannot change. We should say amen to this. Church, I want to tell you, in every areas of our life, we should know what our practices are. Early Christians, early church practice this. No abortion, okay? Not to kill. But on Lord's day, now see, Didache is talking about Sunday. On Lord's Day, after you have assembled yourself together, break bread and give thanks. Having in addition, confessed your sins that your sacrifice may be pure. So on Lord's Day, that is on a Sunday, when you come together, you break bread and give thanks. So it was a common practice. Whenever people came together for worship, they will break bread. They will have Lord's table. They will have Holy Communion. And what they do? They will confess their sins. Every time when they come in, they will confess their sins so that their sacrifice will be pure, so that their worship will be pure. And this is very important. Didache talks about baptism. Everybody take this very seriously. But concerning baptism, thus baptize. Baptize this way, having first recited all these precepts. That means having recited all the teachings of Bible, teachings of Jesus Christ. Baptize in the name of Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in running water. where you need to baptize in running running water and this is the teaching of didache this is the teaching of didache but if you do not have running water that means if you are living in a country where you do not have running water if you are living in a country where there is scarcity of water. You don't have lake, you don't have pond, you don't have running water, ocean, baptized in some other water. That means in a tank or in a place where you have enough water. And if you cannot baptize in cold, warm the water. You can warm the water. If you cannot, there are places it is ice cold, right? ice cold. You cannot baptize there. So warm the water. That's okay. But if you have neither, that means if you don't have running water or if you don't have a pond, stagnant water, then what you do? Pour water three times on the head in the name of Father, in the name of Son, and in the name of Holy Spirit. What does that mean? If you don't have running water, then go with a stagnant water. Again, it is immersion. But if you don't have running water and even stagnant water, there are countries who don't have waters. They don't have water. What to do? Then what, you, what you need to do? You can pour water three times on head in the name of Father, in the name of Son, and in the name of Holy Spirit. That means Didache was not for sprinkling baptism. Didache was for immersion baptism. And in any case, if you don't have running water, if you don't have stagnant water, 
then the least, at least what you can do was pouring water over your head. Now you know how the sprinkling started, right? So what we did, even though when we have running water, we have stagnant water, we have enough water, we have purified water, even after that, if we use sprinkling, we are using the loop of Didache. We are using a loop of Lilake, which was not the intention of writing this. The intention of writing this was that people should not think, I don't have running water, I don't have stagnant water, so I'm not going to take baptism. People should not be sitting without baptism. That's why Didache said, if you don't have running water, if you don't have uh, stagnant water, then at least this is one thing you can do. You have water to drink, right? Pour three times and say, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are baptized. So friends, that was not the intention of the writer. Intention was to baptize in running water. So if you see this today, can, you, can I get a good amen? How many of you believe? This is such a clear thing, right? What we, see, we are following immersion baptism. We follow this baptism. We teach this baptism. Now you know why we do that? This is why we do. Bible teaches so. First century church did that. Second century church did that. In first 200 years, it was only immersion baptism, adult baptism, in a running water, in, even in a stagnant water. Do you remember when Philip met Enoch, Ethiopian Enoch? Ethiopian Enoch said, oh, I'm talking about Isaiah. And then, then, then Philip spoke about Isaiah. And then he spoke about Christ. And he spoke about baptism. And Enoch is saying, oh, I see water. There is sufficient water here. That means that water was running water. They had sufficient water. Can we go together and have baptism? See, in first century church, they did that. In first 200 years, they did that. Then why the sprinkling baptism today? This is a loop that was found in Didache, which was not intentional by the writers. Writers gave it as the last case. If you don't have anything, then okay, we want you to be baptized. And this is the only way to be baptized. But Christ did not teach that. No, that was not the practices of that day. No, it was not the practices. Pra Sprinkling practices started only after 300 and 400 years. They never had the practice of sprinkling. Okay, now Didache also talks about instruction on visiting prophets. So visiting pastors, visiting prophets, when they come to a church, Bible does not have an instruction about it, but Didache had an instruction about visiting prophets. So pastors, if you're hearing me, Brothers and sisters, if you're hearing me, if you entertain prophets in your house for a month, two months, and six months, you should read this. Instructions on visiting prophets. Regulates how long they're allowed to stay. A visiting prophet should not be allowed to stay more than two to three days. All the prophetic ministry pastors will get angry with me now. Now remember, a visiting prophet should not stay for more than two to three days because they are done with the ministry, they are out. Not, they are not allowed to ask for money. So friends, pumping money for visiting prophets, if you think my God is so happy about it, absolutely no, absolutely no. They, you can give them gift, but they should not be expecting. They should not. Be. So visiting prophets were not allowed to ask money. You know, you can give them, but that's okay. But remember, that was not the practices of first 200 years. If you have a practice like this in your church, friends, you need to relearn now. It also speaks about the elections of overseer and deacons. Your election method, how do you elect overseers and deacons? They have a special regulation. So make sure we know that regulation too. So we spoke about John, we spoke about Clement of Rome, Rome and Justin Martyr. 
Now we should be talking about Ignatius. Ignatius is another disciple of, of John. So Clement was a disciple of Paul, Ignatius, disciple of John. We will talk about Ignatius in our next episode. We have learned in detail what were the teachings of first century church and first century apostles and apostolic fathers. Friends, Clement of Rome gave us a very good lesson, right? Justin Martyr gave us a new energy, right? Didache gave us the confirmation about Bible and biblical teaching. And we are going to learn about Ignatius. Ignatius is very important. The whole theology revolves around the writings of Ignatius and we will learn it. Church should know who Ignatius is. Ignatius was one of the beloved disciple of John the Apostle, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle. We'll talk about it next week.